Hi, my name is Enid, and in this presentation, I'll discuss key examples of works discussed in Bloomer's Magazine, issue six, titled Hypertext, and the Hypertext exhibition map. So, um, during my MA, I was studying arts admin and cultural policy, and for my thesis, I was looking at how the museums meet the challenges of digitally de generated cultures, and how this affects like meaning-making processes within um, a museum, like using new technologies um, to integrate and amplify meetings and add a layer to them, rather than just kind of having like this veneer of oh, it's you can it's touch screen now, and you're using AI and everything, and how it actually Im impacts the meaning of the artifact, and then. Uh, excited with this, I was um, directing Bloomers um, just as the first lockdown kicked off. Um, so Bloomers is a publishing collective and an arts organisation dedicated to amplifying the perspectives of early career artists based in Ireland. And we used to be called uh, Bloomers Emerging Female Artists Ireland, but we've since gotten rid of female because it's not inclusive enough, it's too political, we don't like the gender binary, we want trans artists, we want non-binary, we want everyone uh, to imply, but we still talk about things from a feminist perspective. So we try to talk about things that are current and things that a lot of early career artists are talking about at the same time. And a lot of the work that we choose, we find via Instagram and via open calls. So that's another kind of like thread to the kind of digitalness of Bloomers that it is kind of started off as an Instagram account predominantly, and then we expanded into printed publications. Um, yeah, so when the lockdown kicked off, we were like, how do we talk about COVID-19 without talking about COVID-19? Um, because we kind of like things to take a different perspective perspective um, that kind of brings a wider argument in and with, there was a lot of uh, artists at the time using digital tools um, and a lot of early career artists as well and a lot of students um, so we were kind of asking what informs specifically Irish or Ireland based artists and how our cultural context shapes a unique artistic exploration and situating that approach within the conversation of feminism and publishing um, yeah so we were looking for a way for technology and the digital and feminism to converge and that's how we came across the Cyborg Manifesto by Donna Haraway, um, which was something that explored, um, that grounded our inquiry in a space where feminism and cyborgian theory collided. So the issue includes works which would be considered digital art and others which inform a widened discussion of our evolving relationship of technology, which I think you just discussed a minute ago, and like kind of moving away from the style transfer and about how the wider discussion of uh, technology and various languages and where they overlap and what it means politically. Um, yeah, so there's a piece in the book um, by a Cork-based artist called Natasha Burke, um, which echoes uh, these ideas intrinsic to this discussion without being explicitly digital. Um, the prose which accompanies the work describes binaries which underpin our understanding of the world. Uh, the analysis of language and linguistics is central to the development of AI and digital, but it's also deepening our understanding of meaning-making processes. So um, yeah, um, the bloomers as well. Like, so our first issue was about um, kind of repeal the eighth and um, uh, kind of leaning into our access to contraception. And then uh, for this issue, we kind of revoked back to that a little bit because we were dealing with the cyborg. So like the cyborg was coined, as many of you probably know, um, by Manfred Kleins in 1950. And the word was used to describe what an astronaut would become if he modif modified his biology with medicine to adapt and survive in space, taming a hostile environment by changing the body on a molecular level. So this is synonymous with fiction and catalytic in our evolution, the union of cybernetics and organized organism has shaped and reshaped questions such as what is natural, what is real, what is artificial. And then simultaneously uh, in the 1950s in America, obviously the contraceptive pill was just coming out. So maybe this could be understood as a way that women were taming a hostile environment by kind of reclaiming their own kind of access to con contraception and uh, taking charge of their bodies and their wombs and everything with, with technology. And um, so then we kind of understood the cyborg to be anyone whose body has been changed by technology in any way. So like everyone sitting in this room is a cyborg, like you don't need to be Terminator to be a cyborg. It's if you have a filling or an injection or highlights or, um, you know, like for this issue, we were kind of looking, is language a tool? And does language make you a cyborg because it has changed our bodies? Um, yeah, so the Cyborg Manifesto was written by Donna Haraway in 1985 and presents the model of a cyborg identity that springs from 
Postmodern concepts of the self as mutable and contingent and has much to offer in a world where previously unchanging terms like race, sex and even humanity are problematized and contested. Here, the cyborg depicts a model of fluid identity transcending traditional boundaries of sex and gender and liberation from systems of binary oppositions and privilege. And we were also looking at... Um, do you know the Jeffersons, which is like the Flintstones, but they're up in space? So we were kind of thinking like, oh, do you know, it's the year like 3000 and whatever, and people are like zooming around and everything has evolved so much, but the Jeffersons still like kind of presented this like nuclear family with really traditional gender roles and everything. So yeah, so the cover was actually um, a work by an artist called Ellie Niblock. Um, it's called The Birth Suit, and it's a silicone suit imagined from the year 3024, um, evokes the idea of preservation of our biological species and our collective dependency on the technology that is made abundantly clear uh, during the pandemic. So another artist we were looking at was an artist called Leah Bredendiek, who um, used this uh, 10th century board game found in Ballandary, Westmeath, um, as the basis for a something that she's calling a typeface generation puzzle. So this is how we kind of worked this kind of history into our argument a little bit, by saying that our bodies have a long and inseparable, his, un, inseparable history with technology, and every technology we developed is an extension of our own senses and capabilities. Uh, the spear and the arrow extended the arm, and the telescope extended the eye. Now digital technologies continued the tradition of extending our capabilities into superhuman territories. So a seven by seven dot grade of a 10th century board game found in Ballandary, County West Bead, could be considered an early attempt at applying logic to mental activities or forming uh, computational processes. Sorry. So then this was the typeface uh, generation puzzle uh, made by Leah Bredendiek, who I think was like in second year in a Design West course in Connemara. Um, yeah, so she, um, she yeah, it was made from birch, plywood, spalted beach and concrete and 3D printed plastic. So bringing the relationship with la between language, game and play to the fore and creating a font synonymous with digital text um, and using this as, as the basis for it. And then, um, so Bredendiek's realization of an undelivered speech entitled In the Event of Moon Disaster, written for Richard Nixon in 1969 to be deliver, delivered in the case of Apollo 11 astronauts' inability to return from the moon, presents us with a possible future where mortality is reiterated within our attempt to surpass it. So this was an early career uh, women woman-identifying artist who was making the connect, uh, connection between this kind of like early forms of computational processes in Ireland, um, kind of historical forms of it through this artifact, and then bringing it to, through to this like um, kind of journey that we're taking with technology and the aims that we are kind of that we have with technology which is just ultimately to transcend um, our immortality our, our mortality and to become immortal but then also to protect our mortality at the same time so it was fate has ordained that men who went to the moon to explore in peace will will stay on the moon to rest in peace um, yeah so it's a moving image image piece as well, so that's just a steal, a steal from it. So then this is going back to kind of like the discussion um, of things that are informing kind of uh, technology and the digital and kind of what it means and its evolution. So that's a larger picture of Ellie Niblock's The Birth Suit there now as well. Um, another work by Ellie Niblock is Shrine, which is like more typical, I think, of what people see, want to see when they expect to see like digital art. Um, and this is an experimental art game made in collaboration between Shan Fan and Ellie Niblock. It guides you on a surreal virtual journey, seeking to incite an expanded state of consciousness, making you more receptive to the embodied spirit experience of being online. So the language is being used to create this work or being utilized to create works. Uh, are being interrogated by this kind of like self-reflexively. Um, yeah, so then another work is um, Remembering What I Have Forgotten by Avine Brady. So this work addresses the natural language processing, which is a subfield of linguistics, computer science, and artificial intelligence, and is concerned with the intersections between computers and human language. So using this technology, Avine Brady's chatbot is a tool which confronts the challenges we reconcile with when uniting with artificial intelligence and explores how much, how 
such a machine can truly learn, how much machine can lo tr truly learn about us. So our, our definitions of memory, as well as consequences of, of its pre preservation, imitation and preciousness are central to discussion. So this is a piece that she made when she was on residency in Trinity Institute of Neuroscience. And the format of the diary uh, of a person experience memory loss um, hasn't actually been written by a person but by a generative chatbot that has also learned from experiences uh, from carers and doctors of people with dementia and it's created its own entries so when someone asks the machine how are you it responds by saying fear of the future is a big one i would say for me it's a big question i have what's causing this and is this the start where is it all going to head how am i going to head up which I think is kind of like simultaneously like descriptive of our kind of journey going forward and everything uh, with technology. So then there was more text with the chatbot. And then, um, so Aoife Dunn was a, a first year student in NCAD that we discovered on Instagram that was creating works using a Nintendo DS. Um, so it was a pixelated illustration. I won't, that's what the title is. I won't, I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, uh, it was a pixelated illustration made using a Nintendo DS, which reiterates our use of technologies to measure things that we are eager to understand. So it's posited like windows over seas and skies, and our relationship with technology is nearly a lens through which we explore new and uncertain futures. So this is um, Natasha Burke's Testero Utero Go Litter Room. Uh, which visually summarizes both the safety and isolation experienced during the lockdown as we've begun to exist in bubbles. So traversing through a dark and industrial landscape, the artist's presence is protected but contained, taking measures seemingly unnecessary to adapt and survive this terrain. So her prose, which echoes the piece, uh, has dichotomies that underpin our understanding of the world, uh, binaries and dualisms that we grapple with. So the fact that she's kind of um, trying to protect herself to survive a new territory and that she has the prose going with it, which is based on dualisms, kind of brings it into this argument about, the, or this discussion about like the digital and technology, which I, without it being explicitly digital. Um, yeah, so the prose to go along with it was land, sea, solid, mutable, day, night, held free, organic, synthetic, still move, lost, found, trash, treasure, masculine, feminine, ball sack, womb, destruction, destruction, nurture, detached, union, O2, CO2, abundance, lack, resplendent, dull, soft, hard, bellow, whisper, in, out, flourish, stagnate, birth, death, empathy, apathy, notice, overlook, push, pull, chaos, order, yin and yang. And then, so that kind of informed the, um, the printed publication aspect of uh, hypertext. But um, obviously it was just like during the 2020 winter lockdown and we were meant to have a launch event, but instead we were kind of thinking about how we could bring that outdoors. Um, so what we did is we created a, an outdoor, like site specific um, uh, walking um, exhibition basically. So it was uh, QR code generated and led and you could just walk around Cork City and then scan QR codes at these like particular points. And then it was curated by Bloomer's co-director Kim Crowley, who decided which works were going where, and they were mainly moving image pieces or games, because um, a lot of the artists that featured in the issue, including like Ellie Niblock that I showed you earlier, were making games to make these discussions about the digital and technology and where everything's going. Um, yeah, so it was like you could go outside where the bus station is and scan a QR code, and it was Avine Brady, the artist who made the chatbot-generated uh, book about um, kind of dementia and the experiences there. Uh, she made a moving image piece called the A, to Z, the, the A to Z of what to do when you're waiting for a bus, and it was like, A, do acrobatics, B, like bounce ball and all this stuff, using found moving imagery from like YouTube and places like that. So then that's something then that you're not really usually able to explore uh, in the same way when you're making printed publications like we do so with bloomers um, yeah so uh, people could um, there was, uh, people were doing lots of walks as well over the lockdown <laughs> so it was good that people could have this kind of map and go on and walk and we put places we put points where there was kind of interesting viewpoints in Cork City there was actually up, one up in Bell's Field as well that isn't pictured but yeah it would bring people on this walk like um, Natasha Burke also had a moving image piece about um, them tearing down the Foss building that we obviously put outside um, the site of the former Foss building and everything. 
Um, yeah, so the Hypertext exhibition map was an outdoor social distance friendly walking exhibition. Um, yeah, and then it was just like, it, you know, you wouldn't have been able to do it without digital technology, but then, and then we kind of brought in the argument into it a little bit more, so it was just interesting to do a launch in this way. Um, especially with all of the galleries and exhibitions closed, you could still kind of go outside and experience work. Um, yeah, so um, in our conclusion um, for the issue, we wrote that evolution has brought us to this epochal time where we are confronted with our growing cyborganism, the potentials and limitations of intelligence that is considered natural or artificial and the consequences our planet is facing as a result um, of the way that we've lived. Um, a pressing concern is not that the human will change, but that the political and social hierarchies that will remain the same. So then that's just actually me using the hypertext because we did it on billboards and then stickers around the city. Um, so advancements in technology are facilitating access to information uh, and levels of engagement, activism and subversion that could have previously only been dreamt of. So the multidiscipline, multidisciplinary approach to dissecting and distilling these ideas in response to this shift that has been taken by this group of artists describes our contemporary cyborgian condition because every work brings it back to the body um, and the merging of the body and technology. So um, throughout the story, a multi-dimensional map emerges where we plot fictions and watch them manifest as mountains to be con conquered, space to be occupied and puzzles to be solved. Only with a carefully delineated map can we wisely choreograph the world we are developing and the world that we will jointly inhabit.